Bonjour. Je m'appelle Joseph Polizzi. A, deux, trois. That's all I got. That's it. Crazy American on stage. Pay attention to me. You know, you probably already know this. Americans only speak one language, and it's not even English. So I'm very excited to be here in Brussels today. My very first international speech was in Brussels in 2009. Many of you I can see were still in wee school, petite school, whatever you call it. And uh, what's interesting about that time in 2009, we were going through something called the Great Recession. And it was very similar to what seems to be going on now. People don't know what's going on, lots of questions, you know, marketers, which way do we go? So it's interesting to be here at this time in 2022 and talk about some of the same things moving forward. So we're going to talk about the opportunities. By the way, 2008, 2009, best time to ever start a business, best time to get into marketing. So you're really well situated right now where you are. I'm going to be talking about six key things that I think you can take away with you and move forward. Some of these things, depending on where you're at, are going to mean nothing to you. So just pass over those and I'm hoping to get you one thing. So set your expectations to find that one thing in this presentation that you can take and you can execute in your job moving forward. Okay, you all got into marketing because of the money, right? Big bucks in marketing. So what is, I want you to think about this, what is the easiest way to get a million euro. Okay, I know you're thinking, well, you could be born in it. That's really easy, right? And some of you I see married into it, so congratulations to you. But what is the easiest way? And the easiest way is waiting. It's time. Just simply waiting day after day. And depending on which stock market you look at, whether it's in the States or in Brussels, you basically take 15 euro a day, you put it into some kind of a stock fund, and you wait 35 years, and voila, you're a millionaire. See, really easy, right? So if you look at, so what I'm going to talk about, as Alex said, content marketing. What's the number one success factor for content marketing? And of course, it's time. It's time. We have to wait. If we want to build audiences that know, like, and trust us, we have to make sure that we take the deliver consistent content experiences them over a long period of time. But we're impatient. We don't want to do this, right? But let's look at some examples of why time is so important. Red Bull Media House, I would say, is one of the leading media companies in the world. They just happen to sell energy drinks that are available out in the hall. How did they get their start? How did they build this amazing media enterprise? And if you look at their portfolio, all the social media and the video and the audio, it's just amazing what they've been able to do. But they started as the Red Bulletin magazine in 2005 that they delivered at Formula One events. It took them two years just to get the monthly distribution. It took them six years just to get the United States distribution. And they've been around for 17 years. It's a long period of time. That's how you succeed in media and building audiences. As Alex said, I started Content Marketing Institute with my wife in 2007. Why were we successful? It took us two years just to get to 10,000 subscribers. It took us four years to profitability, and we've been around for 15 years now. So it's much easier, of course, to be successful. Anyone know this guy? Jimmy Donaldson, Mr. Beast the number one YouTuber in the world. People think, oh, overnight success. How did Jimmy do it? Jimmy did it over a long period of time. Started in 2012. It took Jimmy three years just to figure out what he was gonna do videos about. 2016 had 30,000 subscribers on YouTube. And now has over 100 million, been around for 10 years, worth well over 100 million euro. It's crazy how successful. Mr. Beast Burger, launching all kinds of stuff, incredibly successful. But in marketing, we may not have that time. Just in the U.S., the average person stays at a job for four years. If you're looking at marketing specifically, three years. The average mid-level marketer, and any people in this room, you're going to stay at your company for three years. And then chief marketing officers, you know, it's a wonderful place to be when we know that we've probably only got 24 months before we get fired. It's a tough position to be in, right? 
So we don't have that time. We are out of time, very similar to the U.S. ran out of time against the Netherlands. We needed a lot more time because we didn't play very well at all in that match. And it's the one time of the year, by the way, that we actually watch football in, well, real football, not American football in the United States. So we're very excited. It's, it's peak time for us right now. So we're out of time. What do we do? We've got to build these audiences. You want to keep your job. I would say that a solid long-term strategy is probably not enough for you right now. You need to make some decisions in your marketing business to focus on your audiences in different ways. And that's what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to give you five plus a bonus. So we're going to talk about five here is my little roadmap up here. And then I'm going to give you a little bonus one to lead by. And look for that one thing in this presentation that you can take forward. All right. I want you to think. I want you to work on this one. If all the content that you created, your podcasts, your blogs, your emails, your webinars, your ebooks, your TikTok channel, whatever it is, if you stopped all of it, would your customers even notice? And it's a tough question, right? Because we probably would say they really wouldn't care. They wouldn't even, oh yeah, we haven't been producing our TikTok videos for two months now. Oh, I didn't even know. I had no idea. Oh, we stopped emailing you. Thank God. Right? <laughs> They're probably so excited. The solution, a lot of marketing executives I talk to always say, we need more content. We need to create more stuff. Right? It's never the, never the right way to go. And I've had the pleasure of going into a lot of large enterprises around the world and when we do these big content audits and we sit down and look at all the stuff they're doing, they always say, okay, Joe's coming in. Joe's a content guy. Joe's going to recommend all sorts of new crazy stuff we can do from a content standpoint. And every time I go in, I've always said, you need to stop doing these things. It's the number one thing I can recommend for you today. You're doing a ton of things. Let's start killing them. According to Content Marketing Institute research, the average enterprise, so you... You're delivering content 13 to 16 different ways right now to your specific audience. So you're doing all the things. It's tough, right? You're doing, he's got so many things going on. We got all the channels, we got all the content, we got different buyer personas. But I want you to think like a media company just for a second. How do media companies build their businesses and create loyal and trusted audiences? They don't do all the things at first. They focus on doing one or two things really, really well, and then they diversify. Let's go back to my favorite media company, Red Bull. How did Red Bull do it, right? They didn't do it by starting all the videos, by shooting people up into space. They didn't start there. They started with a very simple idea of a consistent magazine. Brussels Times, I don't know that much about it, started in 1965. But they started by focusing on covering events in Brussels first, and then they started doing all the things, all the side briefs, the magazine, all the little specific focuses on people in the area. But they started on focusing on one thing first, and then they diversified out. CMI, we were the same way. All we did for the first four years was basically a daily blog. And now CMI has an audience of over 250,000 business marketers on that list. So it's taken a while, but it's the focus start by doing one thing really well. And we, we immediately diversify. I'm sure you've sat in these marketing meetings, right? Okay, here's the campaign. Okay, who's got, the, who's got social? We need Facebook, we need LinkedIn, we need TikTok, we need all kinds of other things that we need going on. Okay, we need webinars, we need ebooks, we need podcasts, we need mini magazines, we need big magazines, we need all the things. We need an event, we need all the things. And you're like, how can I be great at any of those things? There's no way. So I'm in, I'm in Brussels. I've heard you know chocolate. Is that right? I'm going to be partaking in a lot of that chocolate. And my wife tells me I can have every piece of chocolate I have, I can go have beer. So I'm going to do chocolate and then beer, and then we'll go back to chocolate. But I like to start this process. Let's talk about the idea. Think about chocolate this early in the morning. And if you visualize this piece of wonderful Belgian chocolate, this is how much content energy you have. I don't care what kind of 
resources you have, money you have, you only have so much energy. So here's your visualization. Here's your energy that you have for doing all these things. So this is the average company sitting in this, this is you, and you have all these resources and you have to take these little content bits and put them into the right place. And this is what most companies do. They're like, okay, I'm gonna take some of these things and I'm gonna put them to a blog. And I'm gonna take other things and I'm gonna do a mediocre podcast. And I'm gonna take some of this chocolate, I'm gonna move it over, I'm gonna do an okay research program. And then I'm gonna do an absolutely horrible email newsletter. And then I'm gonna do just average social media and then maybe we'll do an event, it might be okay. This is mediocre and this is what 99% of us are doing right now. And we can do better. And I know you don't want to hear this because we want to do all the things and you'll hear some amazing case studies of all the great stuff going on. But if you want to build a loyal and trusted audience, this is where you have to start. Do one or two things really well. An exceptional email newsletter and an amazing podcast in your industry. The number one resource to your target audience for that specific content niche. All right, so that's killing things, that's number one. So I want you to start thinking about, what are some things I can stop doing? Isn't it great, you go into your boss's office, uh, let's see, it'll be Monday, you'll go in and say, I got some great ideas of all the things we can stop doing. You will definitely get promoted after that one. Number two, strong differentiation. In my most recent book, Content Inc., we talk about the two most important things when you're building an audience. One is delivering consistent content over a long period of time. And the second thing is what we call a content tilt. How do you differentiate to break through all the clutter that's out there? More clutter than ever before on the web. How do you do that? Let me give you an example of, of what I see out there when companies are doing this. So let's just take cloud computing. You've all heard of the term before, I'm sure. You probably have businesses in this area, a lot of you. So I just did a little search, a little web search, a little Google search. Who's, doing, who's creating content on, on cloud computing? So I'm like, okay, what is cloud computing? And I go and I look and I find Oracle, and I find Salesforce, and I, and I find IBM, and I find Amazon, and all sorts of other ones. IBM, okay, I said them. They're all on there looking, I'm, and I actually looked at the content. I went through there, and you know what? I could take the content on IBM site for this and move it to AWS, Amazon, and nobody would tell the difference. It is the same exact information. Now, I don't know what reason they had for doing this, doesn't matter, makes the point. You have to be talking about something different. How are you different? How are you telling your story differently? Okay, so we want this thing called this content tilt. How do we break through all that clutter with something that's different? Here's a, another, I'm, I'm looking for all my chocolate examples. Here's another chocolate example. Here's Ann Reardon. Ann Reardon is known as the baking queen of Sydney, Australia. She started a video blog in 2011, 2012, had no money, had no resources, and she wanted to do it about food. I don't know if you are in the food category. Very hard to break through in the food category. So much content, maybe more content in food than any other area. How does Ann break through all that clutter? She takes that chocolate and she does a step-by-step -step YouTube video of how to turn it into an almost workable camera. Good enough to eat. Or a five-pound Snickers bar. Doesn't that look great this morning? Like you just want to dig into that. So what Ann did, so she was a food scientist. She knew her stuff. She had expertise just like you do in your area. Her audience wanted step-by-step -step food recipes. So what does she do? She doesn't do what everyone else is doing. She focuses on impossible dessert recipes, very specific. She said, I can be the leading expert in the world at that. And she was. Five million YouTube subscribers. She's a multimillionaire now. She's doing just fine. And this is what media companies do. They do this through an editorial mission statement. This is going to be your content mission statement for you, you want to define your tilt. And here's the thing, when you create your tilt and your focus and you get in these meetings, it's not about you. Most of our missions are all about us and the products that we create. Your content mission, your tilt, is all about how you're going to solve the pain points of your audience. It does not mention what you sell, ever. 
So let me give you an example of what this looks like, because I want you all, if you don't have one, you need one. So this is Digital Photography School. If you go to their About Us page, you'll find specifically their content mission statement. It says, welcome to DPS, a website with simple tips to help digital camera owners get the most out of their cameras. There's three parts to this. This is the three parts you need for your tilt. One, who's the core target audience? Digital camera owners. What am I going to deliver? Simple tips. This is not long form content, not longer blogs, they're not audio, they're simple tips, bulleted, numbered. And the most important, what is the outcome for the audience? It's the most important thing. What are you trying to help them live a better life or get a better job? Where most of us fall down is we put that outcome as we've got to sell more stuff. Nobody cares about that right now. That's later in the process. We want to focus on how do we solve their problems right now. So helping them get the most out of their cameras. It's a very simple content mission statement. And I would contend that you're creating so much content now in your marketing organizations, you want to talk about this every meeting you get into. Because it's a living document. It's going to change. Because what you know about your audience's pain points and needs will change on a regular basis. So get them involved in your meetings on a regular basis. And if you are a business to business company, you know you have multiple personas, right? Multiple target audiences. You need a different one, for <laughs> different content tilt for every audience. You can't be sending all the same content to eight different groups of people, right? Not going to work. That's our email strategy. Doesn't work. And this is, this is the winning formula for media companies. Nobody likes to talk about it because we're so focused on social media. But it's really, what is your target audience? Who's that specific audience? What's my content tilt? How am I differentiating? One content type, is it audio, video, textual plus image? You gotta pick one. And then what's my main platform? Is it TikTok? Is it YouTube? Is it an email newsletter? Is it a podcast? It's so simple, we just wanna go past. It's like, it can't be that simple. It is that simple. We cannot be seduced to, to move into all these social media channels at once and be mediocre. We want to be great, we want to be amazing, and we have to be to break through all that clutter. All right. Number three. All right. I'm going to be talking about email marketing a little bit, and I know it's going to sound like I'm the old guy from America talking about email marketing and not talking about social media. I'm not saying that social media is not important. It is very important, but it is not the most important when you're looking at all your metrics. Anybody following the Twitter saga lately? Who knows, what's Elon gonna do today? It's a very exciting, it's probably happening right now. You're probably checking, what is he doing? What crazy things is he saying right now? So we're on Twitter, you built your audiences on Twitter for your business, but we don't know whether this company is going to last. I think it will, probably in a different form, but we don't know, right? Let's talk about Meta, my favorite company, Facebook, I'm just joking about that, and Instagram, they just came out a few months ago, right? They changed their entire algorithm so that if you're a business creating content on Instagram, you will never be found organically. Thank you, Zuckerberg. We appreciate that, all this work we're doing. So then we'll continue to change because, right, they don't care about us. They care about content discovery. I'll talk about that in a second. And then I really believe this is going to happen. I don't know what's going on over here in Europe with TikTok, but I really feel in the next two years TikTok could be banned from, from the U.S. for security issues. Who knows how that's going to take place. But the point is we just don't know. We have no control over our distribution with these social media platforms. We, they're not our connections, right? They're their connections. We're just borrowing them. We're renting them. So we don't control distribution, the content, or the data. And if you're in marketing, this is a very tough position to be in. But we've been seduced that way because it's been free, and in a lot of cases, it's worked. But social media, if it's not dead, it is dying because people aren't having interactions as much anymore on these social media channels I talked about, right? They're becoming little Netflixes. It's all about content discovery. And TikTok's algorithm is amazing for doing that. So we want to spend more time on those platforms. But it's rented land. And if we look at this, you know, good example, KBC, Brussels, I pulled up, they have 4,000 uh, connections on LinkedIn, doing an okay job, putting out content, it's getting a little bit of inter interaction, great, right? 
but not their connections, right? Those are LinkedIn's. Those are Microsoft's connections. They're not ours. And that's what I want you to think about is like, when you say my followers, check yourself. Their Twitter followers, their LinkedIn connections that you just happen to be renting at this particular time in this moment as those companies allow you to do so. So it's rented land. So what do we want to focus on? We're going old school. Right now, the solution, it might change. Who knows, marketing's moving fast. But I've been, talking, I've been talking about this for over 20 years now, and it still is the same. Email, first party data, having those connections, having that opt-in, GDPR compliant opt-in is important. And this is what we want. So if you were gonna, a lot of you are taking pictures, this is probably the one I want you to share with your team to think about. You absolutely should be leveraging your social media channels. But we want to move up the hierarchy whenever we can that makes sense. So you get your Facebook fans, you get your Instagram followers, you get your TikTok followers, you get your LinkedIn connections, and we want to go up. We want to move that into podcasts a little bit better. We can control distribution a little bit more, but not all the way. So you still got Apple and Google and Spotify that are taking care of that for us. But where can we have the most control is in our email or direct membership. So it's a rent-to-own strategy. And if you look at the media business today, which I'm in all the time, the most valuable companies in the world from a media standpoint have robust email databases and many, many different subscriptions. So for you to work this thing, you need a remarkable email deliverable. And that doesn't mean getting 5 to 10% open rate. I talked with a marketer the other day. We were talking about open rates. That it's very hard today to figure them out because Apple's changing all the rules. But you say, okay, well, what's your open rate? Very proud of his 8.7% open rate. Very excited. And I said, you are spamming your audience. That's terrible. It should be at least 20%, 30%, 40%. So you need a remarkable newsletter. I don't know if any of you have watched the show Cheers. I grew up on Cheers which will tell you a lot about me. This is Norm Peterson. Norm Peterson came into the bar every day and cheers in Boston. And he showed up every time on time, very important, wanted his beer. And every time he showed up, he said something interesting. And this is the only two things you need to do. If you're sending an email, you want to send it consistently every day, week, month, whatever your frequency is. And when you do, be interesting, be helpful. That's it. Don't sell so much. Do we have to sell all the time? No, we don't. We want to build relationships, make this thing work. BuzzFeed, U.S. media company out there, 2015, they were really struggling because all their audiences were built mostly on Facebook at the time. And the executive team sat down and said, oh, my God, all of our audience distribution, all of our content distribution is controlled by other companies. What do we do? And they said, 2015, we're going to get 1 million opt-in subscribers. They did that. And now they have over 60 different email newsletters, some as sophisticated as Dog A Day or The Week in Cats, which is amazing, right, that that's their audience. So how can you deliver really customized email solutions to your audience that they're actually going to open up? Because you're up here probably all thinking, I don't even look at my emails. But there's one or two emails every day that you open up, right? You're like, oh, I've got to open this. This is really important for my career or my life my family, whatever it is, focus on being that, the one or two that they open every day. So my new company, The Tilt, we focus on the creator economy. We said, okay, well, our thing is going to be an email newsletter. That's our key platform. And we're going to focus on two social networks, LinkedIn and Twitter, to drive traffic back to that. It's a very simple strategy, but you can look at something like this for every audience persona that you target. All right, number four. All right, if the other three things that I just talked about, if you said, you're boring me, Joe, not relevant, not important, this is, the, this is the money number. This is the most important. This is the trend that's happening in the States right now that a lot of people are just starting to talk about that all marketers will be doing in the next three to five years. So you get the jump on that. Acquiring content assets. So I started in the publishing media industry in 99, 2000, so it's been 22, 23 years. And I was taught 
by some of the smartest publishers out there that when you do your budgets for the next year, you grow two ways, right? You grow organically. What are the things we're going to do ourselves to grow our revenues and profits? And then how the other half is, who are we going to acquire? Who are we going to acquire in our space so we can grow more rapidly? And what we found out is that marketers don't do this very often, right? How many, uh, how many email lists or how many podcasts or how many... Uh, blog sites have you purchased in your company over the past five years? Probably none. Most of us don't focus on that. But if we want to do media, which we're all doing, you're all media companies, we've got to look at both sides, organic growth and acquisition growth. New York Times, a very small newspaper in the States, a lot of people look at the New York Times and they're like, oh, of course, they made the transition over from print to digital, and that's why they're successful. No, that's not why they're successful. They're successful because of their acquisition strategy. They purchased Wirecutter, an amazing e-commerce site that has really grown their e-revenues. A little, anybody know Wordle? This little site called Wordle that they, they purchased for a song. Do you say, you have that saying? Do you say purchase for a song? It means it's they ver for a, like a six-pack of Duval. That's, that's how much they purchase that for. It's very inexpensive. And then the Athletic, the le one of the leading sports media sites, they purchase them. And of course, if you look at their revenues and their profits, by any way you look at them over the past couple of years, New York Times has been successful. And a lot of people don't look at how they become successful. But then you might say, Joe, but what about Red Bull? What about something like that? Well... They've moved that direction as well and been doing it for a long time. So you have to think about your strategy of growth, mostly organic in the past. You've got to focus on acquiring. Red Bull, half, about half of the brands that they have have been purchased over time. We don't think about that. We don't look at it, but it's absolutely true. Here's a company called Aero Electronics. They did $34 billion in revenue last year. They're a Fortune 120 company. If you said, Joe... Who's the largest and leading media company in the business-to-business -business electronic space? I would say it's not a media company. It's Aero Electronics. They sell electronics equipment. How'd they do that? They purchased every one of these media companies. In all, it was 52 or 53 brands. They whittled those down to about 30. They have over a million opt-in followers and all these. And what's amazing about this is they're profitable just with these publications. They market their services as well, but they're actually driving profit. I'll get to that in a second as we go. Anybody familiar with marketing automation HubSpot? HubSpot is amazing what they're doing in this strategy. They bought The Hustle, which is uh, about 1.5 million email newsletter lists that they purchased for not a lot of money, and they created an entire creator program where they have a specific group in their organization that's only focused on strategic relationships with creators, content creators out there, and then buying companies in the media space. So that they, they're trying to be the number one media comp company for small business tech that's out there. And why not? So let's look at the creator economy. If you're not familiar with that term, these are all the content creators out there trying to build full-time businesses. They're bloggers, they're YouTubers, they're TikTokers, and they're trying to build a full-time business, and that's what we cover at the tilt. There's 200 million of these individuals out there. They, they're making between 50 and 100,000 a year. They're really, really good at building audience, but they're terrible at making money. And 20% of this group of people are looking to sell. They're looking to sell to you. Because they're like, hey, I've grown a big audience, but I don't know how to monetize. Well, you do a really good job monetizing because you have products and services already. So you can go out and purchase these companies that are out there. So I want you to start thinking about this. And here's a little to-do, some take-home about how you can do this. So first of all, this is a new thing. You're probably not used to this. You have to find the person in your organization that's responsible for money. <laughs> Who's the, who, is it the chief financial officer? Who's the person that's going to allow you to do this? So talk to them. Talk to them about the HubSpot strategy, the Aero electronic strategy, that this is happening right now. And then you make your wish list. Who are the bloggers in your industry? Who, basically, where's your audience hanging out if they're not with you? Where are, are they on a blog? Are they following a certain TikTok? Is it a YouTube channel? Is it a podcast? Make a list of all these 
And then we're going to start trying this out. Let's test some of these. Reach out to these people. See if you can get some partnerships, some programs together. See what works. Make your short list and you try one. And I know this sounds really, really weird. And you're like, no, I'm not in Belgium. We're not doing that stuff. But I tell you, absolutely, this is going to happen. It's very, very difficult to build it. As you know, to build an audience, these people have done it. So you can either spend the 18 months, two years, three years in building this, in this uncertainty that we're at, or you can go and buy them for not that much money. The, in a lot of cases, the cost of one campaign maybe that you're doing. All right, number five. Last one and then we'll get to the bonus. Driving diverse revenue streams. When I talk to a lot of marketers out there, this is their content marketing strategy. This is basically what it looks like. I've got my website, we're doing the blogging, we're focused on search engine optimization, we want to be found in Google, we're going to do some ebooks for lead generation, we're going to drive leads through social, we're going to have our wonderful email program, boom, we're done. That's it. And that's fine, but that's like, it's like, market, it's like content marketing 1.0. This is the minimum, this is table stakes, this is it. But as Robert Rose and I talked about in our this is our 2017 book, Killing Marketing. We made the contention that marketing, your group of people in your organization, should generate profit by itself. I don't know if that is that, is that exciting. I don't know if that I don't know if that is a good feeling or not. Basically, you're going to have to do that, I believe, to keep your job in the future. You have to think more like a media company and drive different sorts of direct revenue. So this is the model. This is it. So you build a loyal audience, you're just like a media company, you've built a loyal audience around some content niche. And you can drive money directly, like a media company does, or you can drive money indirectly, which is what most of us do. Most of us have one or two revenue drivers. You're trying to sell more products, you're trying to sell more services, maybe you're driving loyalty, maybe you're trying to increase the value of your customer. Those are all great things. But at the same time, you could be driving all these direct revenue lines as well. It's a really good case study from the States. Now a global hospital chain, the Cleveland Clinic. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. So this hospital started in Cleveland, but it is a, it's a global, one of the largest hospital chains in the world. They started this blog back in 2012 called Health Essentials. It now gets between 12 and 15 million to their site every month moving forward. This site generates revenue over and above all the expenses to put this together. So they're actually a little media company that's generating profit by itself. Now the goal is they're trying to drive more patients into the hospital, more hospital touch points, whether that's online or in the hospitals themselves. So that's their content marketing goal. That's their marketing goal, if you will. But they're generating revenues through advertising sponsorship. They create sponsored content opportunities. They do content syndication. They create content for their partners. They do consulting. And they are generating millions and millions just off of that, just like a media company would. At the same time, they're delivering on their marketing objectives. So I think that this is going to be more of the norm going forward where you can do this and it works and it can actually work in your business model as you go forward. So just a couple of examples. So it's, oh, hey, what do you mean by advertising sponsorship? So let's say you have a really, really amazing email newsletter. Is it okay to sell part of that space to a non-competitive partner? Yes. Sure it is, you're just not used to it. But you could do that, you could sell that space. What about a conference and event? Salesforce is here, they have an amazing event they hold every year in San Francisco called Dreamforce. Before COVID, this, is a, you know, this event by itself would be valued at a billion or more. It is amazing, they can do whatever they want with it. It is an amazing asset that they've created from an event standpoint. Premium content, you could create books and sell books audiobooks, if you look at subscription strategies, you can put a little training program together, lots of things that you can do for money. Nothing wrong with that from a direct standpoint. So I'm going to challenge you a little bit here, and I want you to try this. And again, we're talking about uncertain times. I think we have to push our strategy a little bit more and be a little bit more risky at this time. I think that when we launched, I mean, shoot. 2008, 2009 was a very challenging time. We launched Content Marketing Institute. Everybody thought we were crazy to do that. The reason why Content Marketing Institute was successful 
is because the other media companies in that space, the really popular, they were battening down the hatches. They were basically just focusing on their core audience. They weren't doing anything to focus on this particular audience, and we were able to break out. There's a huge opportunity right now because your competition is doing the same thing. So you can be a little bit risky when it comes to this and focus on what's that channel you're building, your, what we call a minimum viable audience. Do you have 5,000, 10,000, if you're a B2B company, 10,000 email subscribers, let's say. You could focus on that. You could make a list of non-competitive partners and you could try some things and see if it works. Try some webinar programs. Try some ebook partnership programs where you can generate some revenue off of it. And then once you figure out how it works in your organization, you can try something else. It takes about, from start to 18 months to build what we would call a minimum viable audience. Until it, you get to that 18 month, 24 month mark, that's about the time when you can monetize directly. So if you're starting today, it's good. It's going to take some time for you to build something that valuable. If you've been doing something for two years, you probably have something already that you can monetize directly. All right. You ready for the bonus idea? Everybody ready? How are we doing? Ready for the bonus idea? All right. Thank you very much. Here's the bonus idea. It's, a re it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be amazing. Leave the company that you're with right now is the best. <laughs> Now I say this jokingly, but I don't, but it's true. But it's absolutely, <laughs> it's absolutely true. It's up to you, and I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna do a, a call, but as they say in the business, a callback to this example. This is such a compelling case study. We, I've got the new version of Epic Content Marketing we talked about coming out next year. And we did a full expose on uh, Cleveland Clinic and how they're doing this model. And I, we did a lot of research into the history of it. So again, this is just a blog. They've got about 15 million people coming to this site every month. They generate profit from it. It's an amazing business model, right? It was started by this man. Scott Linnebarger in 2009 goes to the executive team at Cleveland Clinic and he's begging them. He's saying, we have to build audience. We have to do this. This is the moment. I want to do a blog. I want to answer all our customers' questions. I want to differentiate and break through all the other clutter out there in the hospital space. How do we do that? How do we create these amazing content experiences? And he had this idea for Health Hub, which became Health Essentials. So 2000, just, just think of, if you're in that position, you know what this gentleman's going through, right? He's just, he's working it. He's having all the meetings. He's like, you've got to do content marketing stuff. It's so important. Please, would you do this? I'm dying here. Finally, in 2012, they get up the beta, Health Hub, Health Essentials. Well, you know what happens in 2012? Scott's exhausted. He, finally, the company bought in, and he's like, I can't take it anymore. I want to leave. I'm done. I want to go do something else. Well, Amanda Todorovic, at the same time in 2012 that Scott is just, he's done, Amanda comes over. And she's working at a media company in the healthcare field and says, I want a new opportunity. Who's out there that's been doing this for two or three or four years, doing this content marketing thing, that I can go and slide into that position and be successful and be a complete rock star? And that's exactly what she did. So she started in 2013. She starts in 2013. Scott leaves and goes and does something else, but Amanda comes in, she leaves her position, and now she just, I think she got Content Marketer of the Year, she wins all the awards, she's doing all the keynotes, she's now Executive Director of Content Marketing for the large, one of the largest hospital chains in the world, and she's doing a world tour of how amazing she is. And she is amazing, by the way, but there's poor Scott, he was done. So, here's the thing. There are a lot of companies out there in Belgium that have just done the same thing. Somebody has really worked hard building that whole thing and getting the whole thing set up for content marketing and right now they're exhausted. They're going to leave and you're like, I can't get buy-in at my current company. I've tried and tried. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to just keep, the, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and over again? Well, maybe you should just leave. So, my advice <laughs> is find a company that buys in. If you've tried over and over again and you can't get it to work and you can't get your organization to buy into this type, to building an audience, to really going in this next direction, 
Find somebody that's been doing it for three years and become an Amanda. Be Amanda is basically what I'm trying to tell you to, do, to be. All right. In wrapping up, here's what I want you to think about. Here's the four things I want you to do. What's something that you can kill going into 2023? Not like a marketing, I have to be specific. A, so people record this and then they'll take me out of context. What's a marketing initiative that you can kill? Something that is not adding value that you can take those resources and put to something else and be amazing. That's one. Two, be honest with your team. Are you really differentiating? Are you really delivering value in that email newsletter? A little good, good activity to do. Get your marketing team around the table and look at your marketing. Have you, are you reading it? Are you opening the emails? I don't know. Is it really engaging? Is it working? So that's two. Number three, by all means, there, I looked at the agenda. By the way, great job with the agenda. You are going to have some amazing social media examples and cases to go through here. And by all means, learn from them, lean into them, all good. But remember, it's not your land. That's not yours. That's theirs. You are building up Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and whatever else. I mean, I lived through Google+. Plus. I, I, I worked with a marketer at a large enterprise that literally the, the day Google+, Plus said we we're shutting down, cried. They had over, they grew up their little photography uh, Google Plus to over a million people that were, and then the next day it was gone. It's like, oh, boo hoo, that's terrible. Don't do that. Don't do that. Rent to own, move it over to something you can control. And number four, in these uncertain times, yes, there's a huge opportunity though. Time is of the essence. Take this seriously. You can do all the work and do all the content marketing and build your own audience, and it takes time and patience as we talked about. Or you can go out and buy some of these things, put in the process now, and go ahead and buy that first song and save yourself a lot of time and trouble. Did everyone find your one thing? I, can't, I don't know how many miles. I flew a lot of miles to be here. Did everyone find your one thing? Yes. Thank you very much. I'm Joe Polizzi. Really appreciate being here. Thank you. <laughs>